inspired me to make my first drag dance, which brought me to my artistic calling. Then I grew up to take the role of diva, to play the diva, but through the filter or in the framework of these gay artists and writers, in a kind of feedback loop, or a kind of copying, like the screen prints that we see here. I'm a drag diva and a fangirl of gay fanboys. <laughs> In a loop. <laughs> My own experience with idols and as an artist is super complicated and superimposed on the issues of these works. I'm going to peel back some of those layers now and give a little, little personal context. So when I was around 13, I set up a fake apartment in the unfinished basement of our suburban Colorado home. I furnished it with some of the stuff from, that my mom wasn't into at the moment, some vases, an old chair that had been my grandma's, a rag rug, a lamp, and a giant brass Moroccan plate that became the coffee table. It was my own version of an urban loft, cement floor, dubious light, sweltering in summer, and freezing in winter. There was room to dance there, though, and to read. Uh, there were two cultural artifacts that came out right around then that inspired my desire for the grit and glamour of urban living, specific details that shaped my consciousness. One was the warehouse loft belonging to Alex, the welder by day, dancer by night of the ultimate 80s movie flash dance. <laughs> I wanted Alex's drive and I wanted her apartment. I wanted to sleep next to an exposed brick wall with the city lights bleeding into my window all night and then roll out of bed in the morning into a cut up sweatshirt and some leg warmers and then into the studio where I would dance it out. <laughs> Little did I know that the concept of actual lived workspace for urban artists would be extinct by the time I was old enough to live on my own. <laughs> the other thing that inspired me was a book called Edie, an American Biography. Pass that around if you want. The book focused on the white hot image of 60s icon Edie Sedgwick, one of the first of a parade of figures Andy Warhol would call his superstars. I still remember one of my favorite images from the book, I have it marked there, of Edie getting her hair cut on the fire escape of the factory. I would pretend my collar, I could pretend my Colorado basement was an urban apartment all I wanted, but would I ever be cool enough to have a fire escape? <laughs> would I ever be muse to a gay bestie who would film me getting my hair cut to match his so we could cavort around and confuse people? The format of the book was a series of interviews, a map where all roads led to Edie, and the major thoroughfare ran through Andy Warhol's factory. Warhol's factory was where he and his team made his art, the paintings, the films. Warhol never had qualms about admitting that his, work, his works were products and made by a team, sometimes not even touched by his hands. The factory was a factory, but also a cult, and a scene, and perhaps most importantly, a kind of queering of the Hollywood studio system that Warhol loved so much. The Edie book was my first introduction to the concept of a scene and what it meant to be part of one. And the scene was the factory, lawless, senseless, fraught, and fabulous. That was so for me. That many of its denizens ended up dead or burned up drug casualties did not really register with my 13-year-old brain at all. I think the gloss on it made it seem unreal enough not to frighten me, although I would remain a very obedient product of the Nancy Reagan just say no to drugs era until well into the Clinton years. <laughs> The other thing I got deeply into at 13 was the proto-goth art rock band Bauhaus. But we'll circle back to that later. <laughs> the Edie book pulls no punches where Andy Warhol is concerned and makes no secret of the ways in which the scenes he orchestrated used people up. It was not all Andy's fault. Partly the times, what people knew and didn't resulted in that craziness. But it's also not a mystery that lots of folks from Andy's ooh died poor and went mad. 
and he got rich. But just as I'm not here to tell you Andy Warhol's life story, neither am I here to denigrate him in front of his works. <laughs> We're here to celebrate, but we can't deny that Warhol is, as we like to say in the early 90s, problematic. <laughs> and where artists are concerned, that creates complexity. But what was most charming and most maddening about Warhol was his apparent simplicity. Truman Capote called him the states without a secret. The king of the one word yes or no answer, he made an art form of the failed interview. Allegedly once on television, he sat in silence until the interviewer accused him of not wanting to be there, and then he just left. <laughs> So much of Warhol's work is based on fandom. And because his work ranged so wide, it's easy to forget that the fandom on which it's based is pretty gay. Gay fandom is special, and it consists of an extra special relationship between fan and superstar. Not only did Warhol create superstars whose superstardom was a kind of weird in-joke, he used his work to celebrate the stars of the culture. The household product and the household name were the pillars of his most celebrated subject matter, the Campbell soup can and Marilyn Monroe. But today I wanna to talk about two pieces we see before us, and one we can just barely see around the corner even though I'm not supposed to talk about it because it's in the other room. <laughs> um, National Velvet here and Jackie Triptych, which we'll talk about in a second. We're gonna start here first. Let's get into Liz. She hated when people called her that, by the way. For those of you who don't know Elizabeth Taylor, she was kind of Angelina Jolie, Lindsay Lohan of her time. A child star turned larger than life sex symbol whose relationship and health issues kept the tabloids in business. She was also a world-class best girlfriend to the gays. She saved the life of her tortured friend, Montgomery Clift, after he wrapped his sports car around a tree and she was one of the first celebrity AIDS activists. Here she is at age 12 in 1944, playing Velvet in National Velvet, which is a beautiful Technicolor film about a horse-obsessed girl who dresses in jockey drag so she can ride her beloved horse, Pie, in a race. Yeah, that's been great. She, she, could, was, she wouldn't have been upright yet. Cultural <laughs> critic Wayne Christenbaum, to whom I referred earlier, muses on Elizabeth Taylor in his lush camp essay, The Elizabeth Taylor Puzzle, which I am floating around somewhere. He says of himself, you will say he has an Elizabeth Taylor fetish, and I will meekly smile, and you will either discountenance my love or will admit that years ago you adored her but outgrew the crush. Or did you sink deeper into it and never surface did you grow sluggish watching National Velvet for the 13th time? Here, Warhol makes us watch National Velvet 42 times. He has an Elizabeth Taylor fetish. Warhol has many fetishes. We might grow sluggish looking at image after image of Elizabeth Taylor as National Velvet. Here, her nascent charisma and chemistry wear themselves out and nearly disappear by the 42nd frame. The paint grows sluggish. Warhol Gloat grows sluggish as he views Taylor. You can hear his signature utterance, a barely, very, a barely audible and bland, wow. <laughs> I'm intrigued by Warhol the dispassionate fanboy by his sluggish fetishes. I'm intrigued by Warhol's wow. He loves everything and expresses nothing. How can we embody idols with the distance of dispassion? Wow. Which is normally an exclamation, wow! But for him it never was. Warhol never knew the exclamation mark in his own expression. He undercuts the wow with an inability to be impressed but the work is all about being impressed. 
It's about fandom, about loving and embracing the culture at large, the impressive and the mundane, household names and household products, household names as household products, and vice versa. The work is also about literal impression, the impression of the screen print paint on the material, making copies, impressions that fade the more that they repeat. So let's just turn our attention now to another person who kept herself carefully modulated and out of the zone of the exclamation, Jacqueline Kennedy. I'm gonna run through you guys. She wowed the country in the 1960s as first lady to JFK. Later, she became Jackie O. O. Another of Warhol's infamous laconic replies. I must refer back again to the wonderful Wayne Christenbaum, who wrote a fantastic book called Jackie Under My Skin. You guys have there somewhere. He points out that in the early 60s, the tabloids were all about juxtaposing Jackie and Liz. Again, think Liz as Lindsay Lohan. He quotes a headline that proclaimed Jackie as standing for marriage and taste, and Liz for passion and waste. In his Jackie pieces, and Warhol made a whole lot more of them than we see here, uh, he uses images from newspapers for the first time. The fandom starts to touch on the political, but just barely. The culture treated Jackie like a movie star. How am I? Can you hear me? The din, over the din. This is good. Actually, having talking about movie stars and having like noisy crowds is a really good, good thing. The culture treated Jackie like a movie star, and Warhol was no different. In the Jackie triptych. Warhol zooms in and gets it all up in her face in a way no one was allowed to in 1964 when these were made. She's most famous for, Jackie, is most famous for enduring extreme, gruesome historical events of the magnitude we only find in Greek tragedy. Most famously, the assassination of her husband at her side. She was also lauded for holding it together for America in the wake of JFK's assassination. Warhol once said, I've been thrilled about having Kennedy as president. He was handsome, young, smart, but it didn't bother me too much that he was dead. What bothered me was the way television and radio were programming everybody to feel so sad. It seemed like no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't get away from the thing. This sounds cold, but again, here we have typical dispassionate Andy, and he, in his restraint, is just enacting the restraint the culture so val valued in valiant, stoic Jackie. We would find out later, of course, that she was totally falling apart in private. She had exclamations in her closet with her Givenchy gowns and Chanel suits. And I want to touch a little bit on closets. In his book, The Queen's Throat, when Kistenbaum theorizes that Capri Stonewall gay opera fans, divas, acted as proxies for outness during a time when they couldn't be out of the closet themselves. I think that celebrities acted in the same way for pre Stonewall gay Andy Warhol, and also I think for post Stonewall gay Andy Warhol. Warhol defined our culture of camp, but I don't think we talk nearly enough about Andy Warhol the gay. However, the gay fandom is submerged slightly in Jackie Triptych and in National Velvet. The Marilyn Monroe images, which we can't see here, but you'll look at later, they're more unabashed. Those works, as well as the other portraits, are celebrations that yet manage to undermine the spectacle of celebrity. Some veer it into the abject, like the Marilyn's in the next room, a little bit wrong, but Marilyn's beauty shines through the ugliest of those images. Her image cannot be undermined, nor can Andy Warhol's gay fandom. His wow is non-committal, but it's still there. The works in this room are somber in a way that the Dolly Parton in the other room is not. That piece is more out. Dolly is fully in drag. 
how can you not just be delighted and celebratory in the, in the presence of Dolly Parton? You can't. It's impossible. Speaking of drag, I'm going to take a, a big detour here and circle back <clears throat> to a few years ago when I had an incredible experience. I got to know the bass player from my favorite band from my teen years, Bauhaus. Themselves named for an art movement, a scene, and if you could say they had a hit, it would be Bella Lugosi's Dead, written by the bass player David J. David came to know me through a drag queen musician friend of mine. At the time I met David, he was just finishing up a play, a series of monologues set to songs. The play was Silver for Gold, The Odyssey of Edie Sedgwick. He happened to see me perform, and he liked what he saw, and he asked me to play Edie. And in effect, to be his muse. So I ended up getting to play my teen idol, Warhol's muse, Edie, in a play written by my other teen idol, David J., and be his muse for a while. And by the way, I feel about the word muse the way Elizabeth Taylor feels about the word Liz. I, I kind of hate it. Uh, but I love the experience. An upending of the subject-object relationship, a twisting of artist, muse, idol, mentor, and what brought me to that possibility was my practice of drag. The suspension of disbelief necessary in drag, the only thing that made it possible for me at that point in my life, already a grown-ass woman artist, to play the wayfish muse. I guess a kind of Warholian distance made it possible too. Wow. <laughs> so I know you may have come here for a talk about Warhol and his life and work, and I've talked a lot about myself. But the reason any of this stuff in any of these rooms is important is because of our relationship to it. I'm not here to talk about how important Warhol is or to make you like him. I'm not an art critic. I write personal stories that I perform on stage. So in closing, I want to ask, or ask you to ask yourselves, what is your personal story that these works on earth? Or maybe not these works. What's your relationship to the Agnes Martin, or the Richter, or the Sherman, or the Coons Balloon Dog? How do these works further your understanding of your own life? Thank you. that I connect to through 
can, can connect to through Warhol, and I, and I feel like, I, I, again, there's this way that his fandom is incredibly authentic, and then another way in which the detachment or his dispassion kind of creates a, there's, that enables the artifice, I guess. And um, for me, I find the, I find the authentic through the artifice. It wasn't until I started performing in drag, you know, I, I've talked about this a lot, I emerged from, um, from my dance education into a dance world that valued a kind of austerity and a kind of authenticity that was all about um, you know, all about the no manifesto, Yvonne Rayner, about dancing in our sweats and like not acknowledging the audience, you know, kind of being like to know the no to spectacle ethos. And it was as soon as, I, and that was important for the world and important for me to have, you know, philosophically. But as soon as I actually said yes to spectacle, <laughs> I found my, I found my self. I found my artistic calling, I found, you know, it was in that spectacle, in the artifice in which I was then able to, um, to get real. And I made a show called Faux Real. I mean, in my, you know, in my, I play with artifice and authenticity all the time. My drag name is Phonique. Phonique refers to Faux Queen, which refers to women who do drag, which insinuates that women who do drag are not real drag queens, which I just raise as a challenge, you know. I like, I took up Phonique as my drag name because it's like, oh yeah, watch what I do. You know, it's a little bit of a, a drag queen move, you know. It's like, watch what I do and then tell me it's fake. I dare you, so. <laughs> but it's all fake, too, you know. I also teach, I teach a workshop called All Drag is Faux Drag and Faux Drag is Real. Yes. What is she doing in that picture? These are all from newspaper um, headlines, and I'm not sure where all of them come from because these are so these particular ones are so zoomed in. But I think this one, I'm not sure exactly what she's doing is the is the answer is the, the my my honest answer to your question. But you can look at them and think you know maybe we can figure out what she's doing. Like in that one. You know, the far one, she looks happy. Maybe she's meeting the public. Um, this one, the middle one, we can barely see her, but she looks a little bit pensive in that one. Maybe she's thinking. And then in the first one, she looks a little sad to me. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Good <coughs> question. Just about her question. Yeah. I always see the tristic as acting in different stages of like accepting representation versus rejecting. Oh, I love that. The one on the left, it looks like she obviously doesn't want to conceive. Right. The one in the middle, it's almost like she's in some blocks of just realizing that she's being photographed. Mm. And then the one on the right, she's like, she's ready for the bold. She's in her role. Yeah, yeah. And it is, yeah, it is interesting that they go kind of in a way you can see back in time, right? Like the, that he doesn't go left to right ending with sad, ending with the death of JFK, presumably, right? Or ending with mourning, which she had so much of in her life. Yeah, but a, but a kind of Warholian acceptance of her, her more than 15 minutes of fame. Yeah, her lifetime of fame. Yeah. So is the dispassion of Warhol something that you associate to personally? And if so, is it something you've had to kind of strive for? No, I am so <laughs> not dispassionate. Like, I'm the opposite. And it's not, it's something I, I sort of envy in some people, but it's not something I value, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like, I wish, I, I st well, is it something I have to strive for? Sure, yes, actually it is something I have to strive for, you know. We all have things, like we want a thing and it's beyond our control, so, Right, it, it, with many things in our lives, like you, there is this value and like the dispassion and the Zen, or the you know the, the Buddhist sort of uh, uh, sense that like it's actually good to have to be to be to practice non-attachment, as they say in yoga too. Right. Um, so yes, I mean I think there are ways in which I uh, I strive for that or I aspire to that and and struggle with it and then resent it and then don't do it and then, yeah. So there's, so there's a relationship to just passion, for sure. For me, thanks, I love that.